Hi, this is Josué Bastos presenting from Brazil on the effect of water flow in cracks at pretensioned concrete beams and their cyclic flowing. This is part of my PhD dissertation, which I concluded at Railtech under the guidance of Professor Barkin, Riley Edwards, and Marcus Dersch. I'm thankful for this opportunity to present at the symposium and I'm also thankful for the sponsorship provided by the FRA and the New Rail Center. This presentation will start talking about the research theme and then we'll move on to an investigation of why water can cause material damage and accelerate the structural failure of concrete grass ties. By the way, I say concrete grass ties, which is a North American term. Uh, it's the same as the slippers if you are in some other country around the globe. Today, however, because of time limitation, I can only focus on structural failure. If you want to know more about the material damage part of this investigation, please reach out to me afterwards, and I'll be glad to share more information with you. After that, we'll conclude with some final remarks touching on the summary and the application of the results. So is water detrimental to concrete cross size service life? The images that you see here are of concrete cross ties in the field that have cracks that I want to suggest that were made worse because of the presence of moisture. Is water really accelerating concrete damage? Is material damage reducing the cross size structural capacity? To show you the relevance of these questions, I want to share two videos with you. This first video is of a concrete grass tie being loaded dry in cyclic conditions with the same support conditions presented by ARIMA. It's a four point bending test and this cross tie went up to 11 million cycles without failure when it stops the test. What you're seeing now is a flexural crack that looks like a hairline crack which is very typical for this kind of a pre-stressed beans. Now when we have a wet cross tie, uh, the situation is very different. You see that the cracks are growing further in and they are wider. They are also changing direction and going the longitudinal direction of the cross tie. So they are not just only vertical cracks, but also longitudinal cracks. This cross tie had a periodic water spray applied to it and it failed at about 1.5 million cycles. As opposed to having infinite life, then we have a very short life for this cross ties. So we have here the differences in crack characteristics for dry and wet conditions. For the dry test, we have negligible amount of material exiting the cracks. The cracks form in the first cycle and they are nearly constant afterwards. They remain small hairline cracks and new cracks do not form during the test. However, once we add the water spray, we, we clearly observe loss of concrete material and the cracks grow progressively with the loading cycles. The cracks grow wider as cyclic loading continues and new longitudinal cracks also appear. So this uh, deterioration sequence can be described here. We first have the flexural cracks that may occur in any pre-stressed beams. This is not a structural problem. The tendons are supposed to hold the tensile forces, not the concrete. But the presence of water increases the crack growth rate and size. And that leads to the first question, which is related to concrete degradation. How does water increase crack propagation? But we still have the third step, which is the flexural failure. Even though these cracks are in the tensile region, the cross ties seem to have a shorter life in the presence of water. 
So how can tensile cracks in the concrete lead to flexural failure? Because the tensile, the tensile cracks are not supposed to weaken the cross tie. In, to address the first question, we have a few hypotheses. To remind you, the question is, does in crack water cause concrete material damage? If it didn't, we didn't have to go forward, but uh, we know it does, and we're asking why. It could be because of high water pressure inside the cracks. It could be because of cavitation or leaching of concrete components or even abrasion from water flow and fines. These material hypotheses are uh, labeled M1 through M4, and I don't have time to go into them in detail, but I do share the conclusions we have uh, reached at this point for this hypothesis. As you can see here, uh, hypothesis one, two, and three were fully investigated, and we do not believe that those conditions listed, these three conditions listed, are relevant to causing the concrete damage we saw. The last hypothesis, abrasion from water flow and fines, is likely a cause. However, we haven't yet been able to successfully carry out an experiment to test the hypothesis. Now, moving on to the structural failure part, Let's see what hypothesis we have to explain and why cracked cross ties fail sooner when moisture is present. One hypothesis is the loss of bond, and I'm talking about bond, bond between the concrete and the steel. It's a pretensioned cross tie. And the, this loss of bond or debonding increases the compressive stresses. Another hypothesis is a reduced flexural strength of concrete when it's in the presence of water. And third and last hypothesis is bursting due to rust buildup on the surface of the wires. So these are hypotheses S1, 2, and 3. Let's talk about hypothesis S1, loss of bond. What you see here is a prism, or in, another, in other words, a small-scale specimen that represents the cross site. It was manufactured in the laboratory and it has the same pre-stressing and concrete properties of a cross tie, just simpler and smaller geometry. This prism was tested in four-point bending and was exposed to water. The black arrows represent the support locations, as, uh, while the black line represents a layer of pre-stress. So we have an internal tendon there. The red lines represent the cracks that developed uh, in this test. So you see here, there is a longitudinal crack along the pre-stress wire. Just the same way we had seen in the lab with, with an actual full-size cross tie. And in the field, we also see concrete ties that have longitudinal cracks as shown in this image. And by the way, this cross tie that you see is uh, sub what is in an area of a lot of precipitation, and it's essentially darker because of the presence of moisture. It had snow the night before, and the snow was melting this day. To understand this hypothesis, let's go back to the basics of four-point bending. What you see here is basically a diagram of four-point bending for the bending moments, which is of the same shape for the concrete strain. And here I'm showing the concrete strain at the same level as the 
steel wire for this geometry. So you see here in the diagram, there is a steel wire in the dark gray just below the neutral axis. Now we want to know what the strain of that wire is. And to know that, we need to understand what's the relationship between concrete and steel. If there is bond, then they should have the exactly same strain because of the connection. However, if there is no bond and the steel is only anchored at the ends of the prism, then in that case we have a uniform strain distribution, the same total elongation that you see here. This is the case of post-tensioned uh, elements as opposed to the traditional pre-tensioned cross ties. When we have a pretension prism like this that develops into cracks and has a longitudinal crack along the wire as shown uh, here in red, then we can estimate the strain of the steel at that location as behaving the same way as it would if it was a, a post-tension element. So I'm giving here some numbers just for the example. We can calculate the total elongation at the crack and with that value we know the, the average strain. So the steel strain now does not have the same distribution or this, the exact same distribution as the concrete strain. In other words, the steel has relaxed a little bit in that location uh, where I'm highlighting. This is a problem because crack, the cracking raises concrete stresses due to this relaxation. The tension forces drop where the bond is lost, but the external load still must be resisted and it doesn't change. So more deformation is necessary to stress the steel to the previous levels to resist that uh, tensile force in, uh, coming from the external load. Because of the additional bending, the compressive stresses in the concrete also increase. And eventually this fatigue li the fatigue life of the concrete could be uh, reduced because of the higher stress level. To investigate this hypothesis in the lab, we compare the cyclic life of two cross tie types. The pretension cross ties, which are the classic type uh, in which bound loss is possible, and also for post tensioned unbounded cross ties. Because they are already uniformly uh, distributed, and the, the strain is uniformly distributed along the wire then it's not possible to have additional relaxation of the steel because of longitudinal cracks. So the expectation is if loss of bond reduces flexure capacity of retention beams, then post-tension cross ties should have a longer life. So here we have uh, the results. For the six pretension cross ties loaded to 73% of it, their capacity. We had two dry ties that did not fail, went up to 11 million cycles when we stopped the test, and we had four cross ties subjected to a water spray. And all of these ties failed before 2 million cycles, showing a short life. We also had three post tension cross ties loaded to the same level. One dry cross tie didn't fail. It went to 10 million cycles and it stops the test. And then we had two constant water spray cross ties. Um, one failed at about 8 million cycles and the other one did not fail. So definitely a longer life than the pretension ties. And it's not because these ties with the water spray did 
did not have longitudinal cracks. As you can see here in this image, and this is a post tension tie, uh, longitudinal cracks were present as well. But as I said, the hypothesis is that there is no additional relaxation of the wire here. So in conclusion, loss of bond is likely to contribute to structural failure of the cross ties, the pretension cross ties, right? Um, now, hypothesis S2, property change in water. The rationale is that concrete may fail at lower stresses in water than in air. The fracture properties and strain energy dissipation could be a function of the surrounding fluid characteristics. Our comparison here is very simple. We just see how prisms behave in air and how they behave underwater. The expectation is that if concrete properties change in water, uh, if they are reduced, then prisms submerged should fail at lower loads. And that's what we saw uh, with the results. I'm showing here just static tests, okay, ultimate capacity tests, and we had four replicates for each case, four loaded in air and four lo loaded underwater. The average ultimate capacity for the prisms in air was 30 kips approximately, as opposed to 25 gaps in water, so a significant difference between the two mediums. When we loaded these prisms uh, cyclically, we did not see a different result between the prisms in air and the prisms in water. However, I want to point out here that the load level is a fraction of the corresponding ultimate capacity. So, in other words, the, the prisms in there have their load levels relative to 30 kips, and the prisms in water have their load levels relative to 25 kips. Once that correction is made, then the cycles to failure is similar for both conditions. So the takeaways here are there, there was little difference in number of cycles to failure in water, uh, but that's only if the load was normalized by the corresponding ultimate capacity. But we did see that the static test had uh, showed lower ultimate capacity for prisms in water. The results thus suggest that there is no additional change in performance of concrete in water once repeated loading is applied. But there was that uh, change in performance just be because of the presence of water. But there is no additional change because of cyclic loading. That's what I'm saying here. In conclusion, the strength reduction in water is likely to contribute to structural failure. So the concrete is actually weaker underwater. Uh, hypothesis S3 deals with corrosion. The rationale is that water and oxygen in cracks can lead to formation of expensive oxides, rust. This rust, which is expensive, creates a tensile stress state in the surrounding uh, area of the wire leading to bursting or loss of concrete cover. And the corroded tendons may rupture as well. The first step to analyze this is simply to visually inspect the tested prisms. The expectation is that if corrosion is relevant, then rust should be clearly visible. However, as you can see here, post-failure uh, prisms had no signs whatsoever of rust. You can even see very clearly the indentation marks that come from the manufacturing process. So we can reject the idea that corrosion is playing 
an important role in the structural failure of these concrete ties or prisms. In conclusion, then, we had these three hypotheses investigated, loss of bond, reduced the strength in water, and bursting due to rust buildup. We saw that the first two uh, conditions are likely to contribute to a structural failure of the ties, but rust is not. In summary, we showed evidence that incorrect water accelerates deterioration of pretension concrete beams under cyclic loading. We saw that material damage is probably, or I should say possibly, caused by hydro abrasion, and structural failure is possibly caused by debonding and change of properties of the concrete in water. Even if it's just exposed to, to water and not fully submerged, we expect that the concrete will behave differently because of the characteristics of the surround, surrounding uh, fluid. More broadly, we should carefully make the choice in the design stage if we want to allow a beam to crack or uncrack uh, or behave as an uncracked beam especially if it's pretension. We should differentiate uh, the surface life of concrete cross ties in wet and dry areas because of this effect of the uh, degradation caused by moisture in the cracks. Again, I want to acknowledge the FRA and the New Rail Center for sponsoring this research and making it possible and also the extreme help from our industry partners listed in this slide. I also want to thank Dr. Edwards and Professor Barkin for their tremendous guidance in, the, in this project and in my whole PhD process. The additional support from Marcus Dersch and Arthur, Arthur Lima is greatly appreciated as well. And thank you for your attention and getting through this virtual presentation. If you have any question uh, or need more information, please reach out to me at the email address listed on this slide. Thank you very much.